Daniel Blatter from uh, UCSD, and Bruce will give the introduction. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel. As uh, Doug said, he's visiting from uh, Scripps, where he's the uh, John W. Miles postdoc. He's been there about a year. Uh, he did his PhD at Columbia with Kerry Key, looking at some EM <laughs> inversion techniques. But, and he, prior to that, I guess I wanted to mention was that he had done a, a master's degree in computational science at Stanford. And it's gotten sort of ideas about ways in which inversions could be done and sort of bringing some of those ideas into sort of the geoscience world. The thing that strikes me about uh, Daniel's work is that he's looking at novel and interesting ways of bringing sort of Bayesian methods to sort of the problem of uh, inversion and, and doing it in ways and attacking problems that seem impossibly large to apply to these techniques. So there's a lot of innovation and a lot of insights, and he's going to be telling us about some of those efforts today. So Daniel, welcome. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> I appreciate the introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you all. Um, my talk today is going to be on quantifying melt and volatiles at the LAB by efficient Bayesian sampling. And I hope you can all hear me clearly. I'll try to enunciate clearly. My colleagues, whom I gratefully acknowledge in alphabetical order, are Stephen Constable and Kerry Key, formerly uh, at Scripps and at uh, Lamont. Matthias Morsfeld, who was a postdoc here at Cal and is now a uh, faculty at Scripps. And uh, Samer Naif, uh, who is at Georgia Tech. So by way of personal introduction, um, I got my BS in physics at the University of Utah, uh, then did a 90 degree turn, decided I wanted to do foreign policy and uh, become a uh, foreign service officer. So I got a Middle East studies degree at George Washington University, Elliott School of National Affairs, graduated right as sequester hit. I don't know if you guys remember sequester, it was one of the million iterations where our government decides not to fund itself. And basically the State Department stopped hiring. So that sort of ended that career in its tracks. Plus I was sick of politics at that point. Went back into science, which is far more rational, um, studied computational mathematics for a couple of years at Stanford and really fell in love with it. And then decided, hey, I got to apply these uh, cool algorithms to some interesting problems. And turns out geophysics has all the cool problems that need to be solved. So I decided to get a PhD in geophysics, finished at Columbia in 2020 um, during the middle of the pandemic. I'm currently the John W. Miles Postdoctoral Fellow in Theoretical and Computational Geophysics at the Institute for Geophysics and Planetary Physics at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, San Diego, which is a very long-winded title. I'll be there for about one more year. Uh, my research interests, uh, as Bruce mentioned, is in Bayesian sampling algorithms, in particular applying the Bayesian-derived uncertainties to better understand the role of fluids in crustal and upper mantle geodynamics. So I typically apply these to electromagnetic geophysical data. Um, on the personal side, I'm an avid hiker. I currently live in Salt Lake City. I uh, work and live remotely um, and you know, get up in the mountains whenever I can. And I'm also uh, an avid organizer, particularly of academic workers. So at Columbia, I was a member of the graduate workers of Columbia, the <coughs> RAs and TAs there. And um, as a postdoc at Scripps, I'm a member of UAW 5810, which many of you may be a member of. Um, organizing, again, to keep the pathway to academia as inclusive and open and equitable as possible. So that's enough on the personal front. Uh, today's talk is gonna be in two parts. The first is gonna be about melt and volatiles at the LAB. That's gonna combine electromagnetic imaging with uncertainty quantification and petrological modeling. And the second part will be about that uncertainty quantification aspect, which is key to making meaningful statements about subsurface. And how do we obtain uncertainty on inverted models? And I want to talk about a breakthrough method called randomized and optimized that my colleagues and I have been working on that we think is computationally efficient enough to make uncertainty quantification possible even for really big intractable 3D geophysical inverse problems that currently can only be solved using regularized optimization. So melt and volatiles of the LAB. Here's a little schematic of our understanding of the lithosphere asthenosphere system. We have a rigid, cold, brittle lithosphere sitting on top of a warm, convecting, ductile asthenosphere. And it turns out this is really an important feature of our planet. Um, Venus, our sister planet, has a very gradual transition from lithosphere to asthenosphere and doesn't have plate tectonics and doesn't have life as a result. Plate tectonics has been crucial to the evolution of life on our planet. So we need this abrupt transition from lithosphere to asthenosphere, but we still don't know what causes it. There is an abrupt drop, we know, in seismic velocity at the base of the lithosphere and an abrupt increase in electroconductivity at the base of the lithosphere. But what is causing those transitions is still unknown. 
The two leading hypotheses are that it is either melt or water dissolved in mantle minerals. Both reduce um, the viscosity of the earth and there, therefore could provide this sort of abrupt transition. Both enhance the electrical conductivity of the earth. Um, melt re reduces the seismic velocity, as I mentioned, but doesn't have as much of an effect. Water doesn't have as much of an effect on the seismic velocity, but either way, whether it's melt or water, the role of volatiles, and what I mean by that is water and CO2, is going to be critical because volatiles lower the peridotite solidus, making at a constant temperature melt more, a larger melt fraction stable. Um, in addition, they partition into the melt phase preferentially, stabilizing that melt further and greatly enhancing its electrical conductivity. So volatiles are going to play a role in this one way or the other, which makes it really important that we use electromagnetic data, which are sensitive to volatiles, and petrological modeling to constrain the melt fraction and volatile concentration of the LAB. So I have a couple of cartoons here. Part A, those orange curves represent curves of constant resistivity or constant shear velocity. And the trade-off being described here is that you can have more melt at a lower temperature or less melt at a higher temperature and get the same electroresistivity or the same shear velocity. In part B, uh, we're only plotting resistivity now because um, the volatile content of melt is not something that seismic velocity is particularly sensitive to, but the same sort of trade-off occurs. You can have more melt with less volatiles in it or less melt with a higher dissolved volatile content and get the same electroresistivity. So at first blush, this is sort of frustrating because we want to pin down the amount of melt and volatiles at the LAB. And this is saying that our data is sort of um, unable to sort of pin that down, that there's an ambiguity here. But that's only if you don't include petrological modeling, because from petrology, we know that the warmer it is, the more melt fraction, the more melt you're going to get, the higher the stable melt fraction. And the more volatiles you put in the mantle, again, the lower the prototype solidus, the higher the stable melt fraction. We're now in cartoon B. Temperature is not represented on one of the axes of the plot, but it's represented in terms of these blue lines. So temperature goes up from the lower right to the upper left and resistivity goes down from the lower left to the upper right. Now, what this says is that if I know the resistivity perfectly and the temperature perfectly, then I know exactly the stable melt fraction and volatile concentration. Of course, we don't know resistivity or temperature perfectly. There's uncertainty associated with both. And if I know what that uncertainty is, if I can quantify it, then I can quantify the uncertainty in melt fraction and volatile content. That is thermodynamically stable. And that's sort of what we're going to do here. Um, we're going to basically get uncertainties in resistivity from inverting magnetotelluric data. And we're going to get some estimate of the uncertainty in temperature from plate cooling models. We wish we had better constraints on temperature and try to pin down the range of sort of um, statistically valid melt fraction and volatile content. Some quick words on the magnetotelluric method. For those of you who aren't familiar, we deploy a bunch of uh, devices to the seafloor. The title slide of this um, talk was essentially looking at one of those devices sitting on a, a ship, the RV Roger Ravel. And then there's basically a bunch of source fields, electromagnetic fields coming down on the earth, raining down on the earth from the ionosphere. And these are natural source fields, obviously they're low frequency. So they tend to penetrate uh, deep into the earth and they induce an electromagnetic response in the earth proportional to its conductivity. So the more conductive the subsurface, the stronger the response we measure at our receivers. Here's some uh, marine EM data, magnetotelluric data collected offshore Nicaragua on the Cocos plate. Um, this is the Serpent data set. It was published in 2013 in Nature by Samer and Naif and colleagues. Um, seven stations indicated by the red triangles are compatible with 1D modeling. And that matters because we want to do Bayesian sampling on these. And until now, all of the Bayesian sampling techniques really are the too computationally costly to do anything more than 1D modeling. So that, that we sort of got lucky in the sense that those seven stations are compatible with 1D modeling. If you look in the lower left corner there, that orange tongue outlined in the black dashed line, that's uh, a conductive anomaly at the base of the lithosphere. That's very interesting to us because that might be indicating, again, the, the LAB and the presence of melt and or volatiles. And so that's what we're gonna analyze that to try to pin down how much melt is present there. Uh, the data are plotted on the right for those seven stations. Uh, the gray lines are the model responses for um, a, a number of randomly selected Bayesian samples. It's just to show you that we are fitting the data well with the single, uh, with 1D responses. 
So what we did is we took each of those stations and inverted them using a trans-dimensional Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. The details are in my 2019 DJI paper if you're interested. If you haven't seen these before, there's a pair of examples of them in the center here for stations S8 and S10. Um, the warmer colors indicate regions of higher probability density. The cooler colors, lower probability density. At each depth, if you read across the plot from left to right, that's a marginal distribution. So it sums to one. And the red lines indicate the fifth and 95th percentiles from left to right, respectively, at each depth. So on the y-axis, you have depth in kilometers, and the x-axis, the log of electrical resistivity. So you can sort of see at each depth the range of resistivities that are sort of uh, compatible with the data and our prior assumptions. That white line is a 1D profile through a two-dimensional um, regularized inversion result using the full data set, just to show you that, you know, the, the 2D inversion result really is compatible at these stations with the 1D inversion result. What we did to try to get uncertainty here, mm -hmm. so these posteriors was produced by about a million samples. And for each one, we computed the resistance over the depth range of the conductive anomaly indicated by those dashed lines, that bright yellow spot. And then we computed the equivalent resistivity of a single layer over that full range that has the same resistance uh, as the computed integrated resistance. And that distribution for equivalent resistivity is shown on the right. And the reason we use equivalent resistivity is because magnetofluoric data really isn't sensitive to the conductivity of any one layer. It's, in, it's sensitive to the integrated conductance over a whole depth range. It's not a particularly, um, it's a diffusive method. So it's more sensitive to integrated features than you know, the specific um, layer properties. The plot in the lower right, and I should probably should have made this bigger, the one that says all, that's the resistivity distribution we're using. When I mentioned that we need uncertainty and resistivity, that's what we're gonna be using for the rest of this talk. It's sort of the accumulated equivalent resistivity for all of the models across all the MT stations. Dan, just to give us an idea, if you know if we don't use resistivity, well, what kind of priors are the, what kind of priors? Would Great question. Use? So we we use a uniform prior across that space um, from negative one to five in log units. So anywhere from 0.1 ohmmeters to 100,000 ohmmeters, we said was equally likely, just because we don't really have particularly strong constraints um, a priori. So this is using a very uninformative prior essentially. The only exception to that is that blue um, wedge on the right-hand side of each of those plots, that's an upper limit on the resistivity of the mantle as a function of temperature. So we basically just said, you know, what is the maximum, or so, yeah, what is the, what is the minimum allowed temperature at each depth? And then what is the resistivity of dry olivine, the most resistive thing that could be down there at that depth, at that temperature? And that's sort of the upper bound on resistivity. So here's temperature, and this is a little bit more depressing because we don't have as good a constraints on temperature, unfortunately. So we just did plate cooling using a pair of different uh, plate cooling models over a range of mantle potential temperatures, a range of plate ages, and we assumed the temperature distribution to be uniform, spanning the 200 degrees Celsius between the end member models at the midpoint of that depth range. So the depth range of the anomaly is the gray shaded region, that magenta dashed line between the orange and green curves uh, here in the center. That's sort of the temperature range that we used, 200 degrees Celsius, which is actually a lot more than most studies assume. Most people sort of just pick a favorite temperature and then say plus or minus 25 Celsius. Um, it, it's, it's a really large uncertainty in temperature and we wish it could be narrower, but we wanted to be more conservative. And here's our method, uh, a Monte Carlo method for estimating melt fraction and volatile content from uncertainty in res resistivity and temperature. So we repeat the following many times first, you draw a sample of resistivity from its distribution, a sample of temperature from its distribution, and then you increase the bulk mantle water content until you match the resistivity, requiring that any melt that is formed is thermodynamically stable with, at the temperature that you drew from its distribution. And then you repeat this over and over again. And what you're seeing on the right are 2D distributions of probability density for melt fraction versus melt water content and versus bulk mantle hydration. So what's, what's the initial resistivity? So you're drawing from the resistivity, you're drawing from the temperature, and then you're decreasing the resistivity based on the water content to get to that? No, so you, you draw a resistivity and a temperature, and then you, you fix bulk mantle water content at zero and compute any uh, stable melt fraction that would occur oh, at okay. that, at that um, temperature. And if none, then you, you compute, you compute the, the resistivity. It's probably too resistive. So you increase the mantle water until you can finally match the resistivity 
okay. basically until you can generate enough melt that you can match these resistivities. Okay. And so the, the phase equilibrium is like a, a simple calculation. Is it what what goes into that calculation? Yeah, it's actually really complicated. Yeah, and it, okay. it's the result of a lot of lab studies that are very challenging to do. Right. So um, there is actually a lot of uncertainty in this whole petrological model right. of determining stability. Right. Um, uh, actually, trying to get this work published in Nature, we're sort of waiting on the last reviewer. The biggest hang-up was that. One of the reviewers hates the model we're using, but there isn't anything else out okay. there because okay. only one lab has done studies like this. But there are models like I'm thinking like melts and P melts, the, sort of the Caltech group and others. Yeah, that sort of a thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that. very much built. Yeah, it's it's based on mostly on on Hirschman's work. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. So basically, what you're seeing here is a really wide range of uncertainty. You can either have a lot of melt at very little water here or much less melt with a lot more water down here. And that's because the uncertainty in temperature is so huge. These are isotherms. This is the coldest one. This is the warmest one. And because we have such a wide range in temperature, we have a wide range in this sort of trade-off. It's a lot easier to interpret this if you marginalize over temperature, which is what you're seeing here. So the blue distributions are marginalized over temperature. All the temperatures are thrown in. And then to show you sort of the effect of temperature, we did the Monte Carlo process again, but we fixed temperature. So all we were sampling over was uncertainty and resistivity. So this guy is the coldest and then progressively warmer until the green distribution is the warmest for melt water, melt fraction, bulk hydration, and melt CO2 content. One of the takeaways from this plot is that the warmest temperatures require unreasonable amounts of melt. So the melt required by the warmest temperatures are in excess of eight volume percent. That's probably not mechanically stable. The coldest temperatures require a lot of water. So the bulk mantle hydration is in excess of a thousand ppm. That's probably too much water for the mantle. So our interpretation was, hey, let's look at these guys in the middle that seem a lot more reasonable. And that gives us between one and a half and four and a half volume weight, uh, percent melt with one and a half and three and a half weight percent water in it. If you want to compare that to um, Mid-Ocean Ridge melting, more glasses, their volatile content is indicated by these black and red dashed lines. It's really compatible only with the warmest temperatures, which we've already ruled out because they produce too much melt. So our conclusion then is that we really need an enriched mantle source to be able to explain this melt channel at the LAB. Where can you get enrichment? Well. Um, from subduction zones in the mantle wedge above subduction slabs, um, or um, you can get it at the transition zone. But really, at these depths, the only reasonable source of additional um, hydration is going to be from plumes. The nearest plume is the Galapagos plume. And you can see effects of the Galapagos plume, far field effects in our survey area, uh, interplay volcanism, bathymetry that's a lot shallower than you would expect for the plate age. So our theory is that the Galapagos plume, which was nearby 15 million years ago, emplaced a bunch of melt at the LAB that has just hung out there for millions of years, probably stabilized by the water in the melt, right? Because as the melt freezes out, the water preferentially um, partitions into the remaining melt, which further stabilizes it by enriching it even more. So the idea is that this melt has just been hanging out beneath the Cocos plate for millions of years after being in place by the Galapagos plume. Either that or melt is actively reaching this region from the Galapagos plume even today over all that distance. Um, but either way, we're sort of predicting this or claiming this is a, a plume source. Now, this may be a little bit outrageous, but another MT study recently imaged a thin conductive channel at the LAB in the Atlantic Basin. Um, this is the uh, PyLab experiment. It's uh, the survey area is right here. The ascension plume is about a thousand kilometers away, and it was closer in the past. So we have a sort of a, a, a parallel study in the Atlantic Basin that saw the same sort of thing, where we also have a conductive channel about the same depth, at about fifty kilometers depth. The resistivities they're seeing are very similar to ours. So the conclusion here is that plumes could be a source of thin hydrous melt channels globally. This doesn't explain the LAB everywhere, but I don't think one explanation sort of fits for the LAB everywhere. I think the LAB is probably a pretty heterogeneous feature and can be explained by different things in different places, but at least in the vicinity of plumes and their tracks, um, the LAB may be caused by 
highly volatile enriched milk being emplaced by plume. And that lasts for a long time. So you know how cold it would have to get before the milk disappeared? Great question. Like, could these things disappear or are they going to be there almost permanently? No, they can definitely disappear. Yeah. Okay. There, there's definitely a temperature at which the melt um, freezes out, or at least becomes so small that I don't think it would be having a huge yeah, impact. Um, but I haven't done, yeah, I can't say I've done exactly that question of like, what, how cold would it take and how long would this stuff live? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so to conclude this first part of my talk, um, we conducted a joint geophysical petrological analysis with the goal of estimating stable melt fraction and its volatile content at the LAB beneath the Cocos plate. This involved electrical resistivity imaging uh, inferred from MT data with uncertainty, temperature inferred from plate cooling models, and petrological modeling of partial melting inferred from uh, based on lab studies, and concluded anywhere from one to four and a half by volume percent melt with one and a half to three and a half weight percent water in it, which requires an enrichment via plume source. And the plumes could be emplacing these long-lived enriched melt channels at the LED globally. So that's enough uh, harebrained uh, geophysical uh, theories for one day. Let's talk about applied mathematics. Let's do some computational math. How did we get the uncertainties and resistivity that were so crucial to coming to the conclusion that this has to this had to be plume emplaced melt? And the way we do that is through Bayesian sampling. So in geophysics, we have a whole bunch of observations usually made at the surface. Um, relatively low resolution with lots of noise. And we're trying to infer physical properties of the subsurface. This method is called inversion. As we know, it's non-unique, it's non-linear and therefore very interesting. It's what drew me to geophysics in the first place. So for example, here's marine magnetotelluric data again uh, from a different location this time. And before we can make any sense of the subsurface from this data, we have to define what's called forward, mod forward modeling. These are terms I'll be using throughout the rest of the talk. So capital F is a nonlinear modeling function that takes my model of subsurface resistivity, M, and outputs my model geophysical observations, my magnetotelluric data, shown on the right, on the left. And then typically what we do is regularized optimization. We say, well, I'm going to define an objective function, little f, that's a combination of data misfit and model regularization, a form of prior assumptions. And I'm going to find a minimizer of that function. For example, if um, my regularization operator L is a first difference operator, it gets something smooth like this, where again, depth is on the y-axis, electroresistivity and log units on the x-axis. It's nice and smooth, so it satisfies my prior. It fits my data, that's the blue curve through the data points, which is all great. It's computationally efficient, but it's just a single model estimate with no associated uncertainty. So if you wanted me to tell you how certain I can be in that little wiggle at 350 meters depth, I couldn't tell you. <coughs> All I could say is this model does just fine, mm -hmm. but there could be lots of other ones that do just fine too and don't have that wiggle. To get that sort of question answered, you have to do Bayesian sampling, or at least I think this is the most intelligent way to go about doing it. It's very simple to understand. It's based on Bayes' rule, as seen below. The term on the left is called the posterior. It's a, it assigns a probability to every model in the model space conditional on the data I've measured and my prior assumptions. The first term on the right is called the likelihood. Um, models that fit the data better have higher probability. And then the last term is the prior. Models that I say have higher probability have higher probability. I get to define this one however I want, incorporating my biases and any outside information I might have. The key is to find a method for drawing samples from the posterior. Because once I have enough of those samples, I can do statistics on those samples and infer uh, the properties of the posterior. That group of samples is called the model ensemble. And generating it is sort of the, the key to doing Bayesian sampling. And it matters the method you use from a computational standpoint, because some methods um, work really well, but are slow. And if you try to apply them to really large problems, you'll be waiting forever to get the answer. But if you can manage to get enough samples, you get something like this, like I showed you uh, in the first part of my talk, where again, the warmer colors indicate higher probability density. Those red lines are the fifth and 95th percentiles. And now that regularized model estimate that I showed you before in black, now it's in white, has sort of error bars around it in a sense. And this is the full range of models compatible with our prior assumptions and our data. And again, the, the model responses from about 200 randomly selected samples are shown in gray on the left. And we really can put error bars on that wiggle, which is sort of the point. 
because then we can use that to make meaningful statements about the subsurface in terms of malfraction, volatile content, et cetera. So how do we draw samples from the posterior? As I said, this really, really matters. And sort of the point of the second part of my talk is that I think my colleagues and I have come up with a way of drawing samples that is way more efficient than sort of the canonical standard way of doing it, which is random walk metropolis, Mark of Chain Monte Carlo. It generates posterior samples by making really small random changes to the current model in the chain. So to give you a, give you a sense of what that means, this is the method I used in part one, a transdimensional Markov chain Monte Carlo. Let's see we're at step N in the algorithm. And I have M sub N is my model at that step. It's a stack of layers, each with its own thickness and electroresistivity. Maybe the warm colors are uh, more resistive in this case and the cool colors more conductive. I first generate a proposal model by changing the nth model in some random way. So I can either add a layer interface randomly, delete a randomly selected layer interface, move a layer interface to a new location randomly, or leave the interfaces where they are and just change the layer resistivities randomly. In this case, I added a random layer interface. And then I accept or reject the proposal model based on its posterior probability relative to the nth model. And because the changes I'm making are purely random, most of my proposals are not going to be accepted. They're gonna make things worse. In fact, ideally you want to be hewing towards 77% of the models being rejected and only 23% accepted. But even to get that low of an acceptance rate, you have to make really small changes, which means your models in your chain in sequence are gonna be highly correlated with one another, which means you have to take a lot of steps to be sure you've covered any real ground. Also, the algorithm is fundamentally serial. I can't draw sample J plus one until sample J has already been drawn. So since I have to do it in sequence, one step after another, the runtime of the total algorithm is determined by how many steps I need to take. And the answer is a lot, more than a million in most cases. And um, by the cost of drawing one sample. So if I, the rule of thumb is if you can't get your, your forward modeling, which is essentially the cost of one sample down to about a second or less, you're gonna be waiting for weeks for random walk metropolis to converge. And if your forward modeling costs you a, a, a minute, heaven forbid, you're gonna be waiting a year, which you know, is just unreasonably long. So we need a new method to, do, to draw samples from the posterior. So let's think uh, outside the box here. We want our models with high posterior probability to fit the data and to satisfy the prior. Now, what other way do we know to find models that do both of those? Well, regularized optimization. That first term on the right ensures that my models fit the data, the solutions to this um, minimization problem fit the data. And the second term ensures that they satisfy my prior assumptions as uh, codified in my regularization term. So if I were to define my likelihood as e to the minus my data fitting term, such that again, models with high, uh, better data fit have higher probability. And if I define my prior in terms of my e to the minus my model regularization term, such that models that satisfy that constraint have higher probability, then I can define a posterior distribution that's just e to the minus little f, my objective function. And what this means is that every minimizer of little f is a maximizer of that posterior distribution. So really there is actually a stochastic interpretation, a Bayesian interpretation of regularized optimization, such that every solution to the regularized optimization problem is a maximizer of the, is a high posterior probability model, but not just a high posterior probability model, the maximum posterior probability estimate. So if that top um, minimization problems solution is the maximum a posteriori model, the map estimate, what we want is to not just sample repeatedly that maximum posterior probability model, we wanna sample all the high posterior probability models around it. And we can do that by making two subtle changes to this objective function as follows. Now we're minimizing the misfit to D tilde, which is a random vector whose mean is equal to the data set I measured and whose covariance is equal to the data error covariance. And now I'm regularizing not just the model, but the difference between the model and a randomly chosen prior model M tilde, where M tilde again is defined by its zero mean and covariance given by the prior covariance matrix, which is defined by my regularization choice, L transpose L inverse times one on mu. So what this does is it ensures that my randomly chosen M tilde, my randomly chosen prior model, my, the, the solution I get has to hew close to that model as much as it can while still fitting the data. 
but not just the same data set, it's any data set that's compatible with the data set I measured in the field in terms of its uncertainty. So the data set I measured in the field plus and minus some noise. And what that allows me to do is to repeatedly solve that middle optimization problem and get a different answer every time, but be guaranteed that it is a high posterior probability model every time, a different high posterior probability model every time. So, the, so is the detail that it got random, does it have random variance added to it too? Like you're adding random noise to the data and just every time? Yes, we, okay. you add, yes you, add, you add random noise to the data every time to get a new realization of the data set. So you're adding random, different random models and different that different noise, I mean, different data, basically. Yes, precisely. In this sense, it's a little bit like bootstrapping, if, if you want to make an analogy to another sort of uncertainty estimation method. So how does this work? Uh, let's look at a simple toy problem, a linear forward, just f of m equals m plus a half, super simple. On the upper right, you're seeing a bunch of objective functions. The solid red line is the canonical uh, regularized objective function. And the dashed lines are the stochastic perturbed objective functions, a few realizations of them. They are distributed, the location of the minima of those functions are distributed according to that blue histogram. The red line is the true Bayesian posterior distribution we're trying to draw samples from. And what this means is in the linear case, the solutions to that objective function in blue, the stochastic objective function, they actually are samples from the Bayesian posterior. So we can draw samples from the Bayesian posterior by solving a stochastic objective function or minimizing a stochastic objective function, solving a stochastic minimization problem. What about the nonlinear case? Here's a simple nonlinear problem. Now you see there's a very small bias between the blue histogram and that red line, which means that the solutions to that, again, that stochastic optimization problem are very nearly samples from the Bayesian posterior. And I would argue that that slight bias, in practice, it's very small, and it's actually dwarfed by the effect on the posterior of our subjective choices of prior, including in how we choose to regularize the model and parameterize the model. So I would argue that this is a, neg a negligible difference and that we can basically just repeatedly solve that objective function, that minimization problem, and just treat the answers, the solutions to it as samples from the Bayesian posterior. So here's the algorithm. It's called randomized and optimized. It was first introduced by Jonathan Bardsley at the University of Montana in 2014. A similar thing was uh, proposed by Dean Oliver in 2011. It's just a for loop. At each iteration of the for loop, you draw a random perturbed data set, D tilde. You draw a prior model, M tilde, randomly. And then you solve the stochastic optimization problem. And then you repeat. There are a number of really nice parts about this algorithm. First off, generating the random data and the random prior models is very simple. Second, this is embarrassingly parallel, this for loop. You can do each iteration of this for loop simultaneously on a separate computer. So you can parallelize to your heart's content. You can use as much high performance computing as you have available to reduce the runtime, which is something that, that was the main bottleneck with random model metropolis, essentially, and it's solved here. Also, because these are independent samples, you don't need as many of them. And I'll show you that later but they carry a lot more information than a sequence of highly correlated samples. So this optimized problem is more than probably one second of compute time, I'm guessing. Oh, for right? sure. Yes. Yeah. So you are, each sample in a random up metropolis is basically the cost of one forward. Right. Here it's the cost of an optimization problem, which is a lot more, probably 10 to 100 times more. But it's independent and it's hugely parallel. Yes. And so, it's, it's, it's a lot fewer optimization problems that you have to do. Yes. Or forward models in the end, because you have to run a lot fewer optimization problems than you have to run um, forward models of the Bayesian, this classic yeah. Bayesian sets. Yeah, the trade off is that this is actually both cheaper in terms of the, the, the total number of flops that you have, the compute time you have to, the compute resources you consume. But the main thing is it's way, way faster in terms of the total runtime. The last thorny issue we have to solve mathematically, and I promise no more math after this, um, is which regularization penalty weight to choose. This guy, he has a huge impact on the prior, therefore a huge impact on the posterior. You don't want to be making this choice ad hoc, which sort of the standard randomized and optimized does. So our solution was to hierarchically sample it, which means letting the data have to choose it. Basically you have new, a new joint posterior where mu is now a variable that you sample over. This is sort of a problem 
because now mu to the n over two appears in, in the front, because now it's a variable. We, before we could neglect it because it was a constant. Right. Now we can't, but you don't want the posterior to depend on the number of parameters you choose on, on the discretization of the model. That's really bad. So we did a fancy change of variables. This again is too much math. You can just sort of glaze over for one slide, I promise. Um, the factor of n's gone because this term is where it came from and we've now normalized it. And then you just basically repeatedly sample the following conditionals. This is Gibbs sampling. You solve for P of C um, at fixed mu, and then P of mu at fixed C using the C from the previous step, and then so on and so forth. And it looks like this. So this is um, the RTO double punch. This is what my <laughs> colleagues and I have been calling it, the RTO TKO, where TKO stands for technical knockout, where it's a technical knockout because there's still that small bias between the sampling distribution and the target distribution. Okay. So this is what I've talked to you about before. This is RTO for the model at fixed mu. And here's RTO again for mu at fixed M where now we're solving this um, optimization problem and we're solving for mu at fixed M where mu ref here is the mu from the previous step. And this is what it looks like for a uniform prior on mu. If you choose a different prior on mu, it looks slightly different, but it's, it's the same principle. You're solving an optimization problem. And essentially what mu does here is it either stretches or squishes um, M and that's what it's allowed to do. All right, so this slide is to convince you that that bias I talked about really is quite small in practice. So this is DC resistivity data, the slumber safe uh, setup. Basically you stick a pair of electrodes in the ground and you just um, measure the resistivity between the two. On the left here, you have a Bayesian distribution, um, estimated, sorry, probability density function estimated using RTO sampling. And on the right, using random walk metropolis. This was 10,000 RTO samples. This is the real of 10 million random walk metropolis samples. So we were really certain to the, that we converged using the random walk metropolis because it's sort of guaranteed to converge if you draw enough samples. And you can see that the two are very, very similar. Slight differences, but for all intents and purposes, they're pretty similar. And then here, um, to show you that the TKO step also has small bias, um, we did RTO both times for the model parameters at fixed mu. And then we sampled over mu using the RTO a second time, the TKO step here, and then using random up metropolis to sample for the regularization penalty weight here. And again, you can see these distributions are extremely similar. Mm -hmm. This is just to show you that the model uncertainty we get from RTO doesn't depend on the parameter grid we choose. So how finely we choose to discretize the model doesn't matter, which is really nice. This is not a trans-dimensional method, which is really powerful, but we're working on that. We haven't got there yet, but at least the, number of layers you choose, the number of parameters you choose does not affect your posterior uncertainty. At each step when you do the optimized, the, the, so you generate a random model and then you do an optimization. Are you just using kind of the standard uh, Occam's approach to that? Um, so it depends in 1D, um, we're using MATLAB's uh, nonlinear least square solver. And um, when I do, I'll show you 2D magnetotelluric inversions, that was using my 2D EM. So okay. yeah, the Occam uh, solver there. But what's beautiful about this algorithm is it doesn't really care what method you no. use, so long as you. Um, I was just thinking, if, you know, if you compare the regularization parameter that comes out of the Occam for those three different cases, of, they're gonna, yeah, they're gonna be very different, but at least they're chosen in a way that's consistent, I guess. Right. Yeah. The, the black line actually is the Occam solution. Yeah. Yeah. The black line here is. Okay. I love this slide. Uh, hey, this <laughs> I think uh, Federico has a question. Oh, cool. Go ahead. Hi, sorry. I'm just wondering, does the speed up comes because you're accelerating the burning of the, the MCMC or is it because you are drawing less, um, less, you're just drawing a couple of samples once you pass the burning stage? Um, it's not because of the burn-in. That's actually an additional point I didn't even make, that there's actually no burn-in here with RTO because every sample is high posterior probability. But the, that's, that's just sort of icing on the cake, not having to deal with the burn-in. The real reason it's fast is because it's parallelizable. So you can mm -hmm. draw all the samples in parallel at the same time instead of one at a time. And it's, it's fast because you don't need as many samples. And that's sort of what this slide is all about. Um, it, it's to show that RTO samples are independent. But have you, sorry, have you yeah, tried? Because, you know, when you, when every time people sell, or every time someone proposes an algorithm, right, there is this, um, you know, you can always compare it with, again, a Metropolis Hastings or 
there are all set of tricks, right? I mean, there are multi-chain uh, MCMCs and there are a lot of other tricks around. So if you choose the slowest one to compare with yours, oh, of course yours is gonna always be better, right? Mm -hmm. So, but if you have you tried, for example, using an optimizer to find an initial gas, an initial, a good initial model basically, and then run an MCMC once you found the body, for instance, or compare this with a, with a multi-chain MCMC? Yeah, so the transmission results I showed you in the first part of my talk, we're using parallel tempering with about 20 chains each. Um, that makes your convergence more robust, but it actually increases your computational cost because now you have 20 chains instead of one and you still need long chains. There's no, there's no substitute for a long markup chain. That's sort of the, the unhappy truth. Um, whether it's uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or you're using uh, parallel tempering, you, you sort of, even after the burn-in, you need really long chains because you're making super tiny steps. It's like the difference between, um, I don't know, like I, I, the analogy I use is that MCMC explores the model space the way a Roomba cleans the floor. It's you know slow and region by region. And it just kind of goes in a straight line until it hits something and then it turns and, and keeps going. And you're sort of left to wonder, okay, I've let it run for a long time. Like, has it cleaned the whole floor? Or are there spots it's missed? And do I need to leave it running for even longer? And that's sort of the trouble you run into with MCMCs. You're never quite sure taking those tiny little steps if you've satisfied, if you've sampled the full model space compatible with your data and your prior, and to sort of satisfy yourself of that fear, you let the chains run really long. And so there's, the rule of thumb is really that you need several hundred thousand, if not more samples per chain, even if you're running multiple chains in parallel. Okay, thanks. So you said it was about a factor of a thousand difference, I think, wasn't it? The difference between the optimization and, and the, uh, the MCMC routines? Did I get that right? Like it was 10,000 and then 10 million for the other, I thought. Um, yeah, in that particular example. Right. So but that's that, something you'd expect typically, or is that unusual? I mean, it's, how would you? It's hard to come. It's hard to come up with a number for that because, again, it's hard to know what is a sufficient number of MCMC samples mm -hmm. and what's overkill. And people tend to hew on the side of caution and just go for overkill and run it forever. Mm -hmm. sort of the joke is that people who do Bayesian sampling they sort of start their chains, they get some preliminary results, they submit a paper for publication, and by the time it's done in peer review, they get the final results at the end. And it's, you know, it's not actually that much of a joke in a lot of cases, like people actually do this. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is, is what's shown on this slide. So what I did is I took 200 consecutive samples using MCMC and 200 consecutive samples using RTO. And I plotted the first sample in red and the last sample in blue. And you can see that, for example, at this layer, this goes from red to blue, from red to blue, from blue to red, from blue to red, and then from red to blue. So there's a lot of trade-offs going on. And you're just sort of like slowly marching along through model space, sampling all the different possible combinations that fit the data. Mm -hmm. Whereas with RTO, there's no discernible color pattern here. Yeah. And in fact, if you look back, it looks like the posterior already. Yeah. And I'm just plotting 200 models. I didn't do statistics on 200 models. Yeah. I just plotted them and you're already seeing the posterior distribution there. And I sort of did it there just to give you like a sense of like how powerful it is drawing independent samples. Right. So let's apply this to a larger data set now because I promised you that that was the whole point of this. So this is 2D MT field data. This is uh, the Gemini data set collected uh, offshore Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico. These blue guys over here are, uh, is a salt body imaged using three different techniques. The upper right is the mean of about 9,000 RTO models. This guy here is a single resistivity model estimate using op regularized optimization. And this guy is the mean of a million random walk metropolis models made, drawn using a very sophisticated trans-dimensional Gaussian process parameterized sampler. And that's, that's this is full 2D? Or, mm -hmm. Okay. Full 2D so model. generating the, the 2D models randomly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here's the data, just to show you that we're fitting the data just fine. The gray lines, again, of the model responses of a, a couple hundred randomly chosen RTO samples. So we're getting basically the same features using all three methods, only the computational cost is vastly different. Here we had 9,000 RTO models. This took 10 or a million TDG fee model, random model metropolis models. And that's an underestimate because I actually had to run 20 chains in parallel using parallel tempering to get that robust to convergence. So really, that's 20 million random walk metropolis samples versus 10,000 RTO samples. It's interesting, though, that the, the 
TDGP looks more like just a single Occam inversion. It's, uh, I mean, it's just scaled up and down, I guess. Yeah, and, and the scale difference is quite slight here too, because yeah. uh, the axis isn't in log units here, it's in ohm meters. And that's just the difference in the way they're parameterized. So the, the TDGP is parameterized using a Gaussian process, um, and then the kernel you choose for that will affect the way the models look. Speaking of which, here are four randomly chosen RTOTKO models. This is just to show you that it really is important that we quantify uncertainty because these models look very different from each other and yet they offer the data equally well. They all satisfy our prior constraints equally well. But what's amazing is if you get a whole bunch of these together, they start giving you really smooth uncertainties. So these are marginal uncertainties across various depth slices. Um, the electroresistivity in log units is on the y-axis, horizontal position in kilometers is on the x-axis. The warmer colors are higher probability density regions. The red lines are again the fifth and 95th percentiles. The white squares are um, the basically model values across that depth slice of a single regularized inversion model estimate. Focus on the plot on the upper left, because I'm going to show it to you four times on the next slide. And this is sort of the punchline slide. This is the same posterior uncertainty estimated using different number of samples, 50 models all the way to 6,000 models. The estimate using 6,000 models down here is a lot smoother. But if you just focus on the, the location and shape of the 90% credible interval, it's about the same up here as it is down here, just more jagged, which means that if all you want is a solid estimate of the range of parameter values within which 90% of the models are gonna lie, you only need a shockingly few number, a little small number of samples. I mean, in this case, 50. We were, this model had 10,000 model parameters in it, and you only needed 50 samples to get a decent estimate of uncertainty. That's amazing. The rule of thumb for MCMC is that you need at least uh, one, maybe 10 uh, samples per model parameter you're sampling over, where here you need far, far fewer than that. I mean, imagine that you were doing 3D modeling of a complicated 3D problem, and you felt like you needed 250 samples and each sample took you an hour to run and you had plenty of computer power, you could get uncertainty in an afternoon, which is something that would literally be impossible using random walker travelers. You'd probably wait more than a year to do that for a complicated 3D problem. So to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that model uncertainty really is a crucial element of the analysis of any geophysical data. We really do need uncertainty on inverted models. That stochastic optimization deter turns deterministic regularized inversion solvers into Bayesian samplers. And it's a very simple uh, sort of uh, philosophy, randomize then optimize. And that our particular implementation, our TOTKO has a lot of desirable properties. It has minimal tuning. In fact, it relies on the architecture of, of the inversion algorithms we already know and love and understand very well. It hierarchically samples the regularization strength it's independent of the choice of parameter grid or my choice of discretization, if you will. It's embarrassingly parallel and therefore incredibly fast. And I'll uh, just leave those up there and be happy to take your questions. Thanks for your time. Yeah, actually, just out of curiosity, how do you take into account the ocean effect when you're doing MT on the oceans? The ocean effect? You mean like uh, sampling for the resistivity of the ocean? No, when you're modeling empty responses, right? So the oceans are huge conductive bodies. Mm -hmm. They will introduce 3D artifacts in your responses, right? Um, oh, yeah, so you need to do modeling that's appropriate with the data you've measured. Sometimes, like in the first part of the talk I mentioned, the empty data we were looking at, we just got lucky. And probably because the sediment package there is so thick, the coast effect is, was minimal for that data and 1D modeling was appropriate. Okay. But yeah, you need to make sure that you're doing modeling that is accurate, right? So if you have 3D effects in your data, you better be doing 3D modeling, which is sort of the upshot of this, you know, the, re the motivation, I guess, for this whole uh, research project was that most marine MT data sets are 2D or 3D compatible. So you really do need a sampler that's efficient for 3D modeling in a lot of cases. Thank you. So maybe if I can add to you more, if you go back to the first one, it's just in that very fundamental question, but your MT result is, looks like a top 20 to 40 was more uncertainty if you go back. Is there any like uh, 
this observational data set or is this MT data inversion in general? Look here, so the down to 40 to 100, I can see very sharp PDF and very constrained, but it top to you know, say 10 to 40 was wide range. Is that in general for the MT? Period? Yeah, <laughs> basically MT is sensitive to conductors. If you put a resistor in there, as long as it's, unless it's massively thick, okay. you're not gonna be sensitive to it. I mean, the MT data will know that it isn't conductive, but it won't know how resistive it is. Because basically beyond a certain resistivity, the MT data just knows it's resistive. There just isn't enough of a signal being generated for it to even respond. So is there any way as a geophysical data can be combined to say, I don't know, gravity, seismic, whatever, and the technique may be able to chop to this data? Oh, totally. Um, the reason we don't really focus on it is because it's, for us, it's just the lithosphere, and we're not really interested in, in the lithosphere. We're, we're interested in what's happening just below it. So for us, the, you know, where the 95th percentile hits the, the right edge of the prior, um, that just means that we're in the lithosphere still. And as soon as that starts to peel away and the 95th percentile starts to drop, then we know we're entering into a, a different regime. Thank you. Good question. You mentioned very briefly uh, Gaussian processes, and I was wondering, are there points of contact between the RTO uh, method and Gaussian processes? You could. We haven't done anything with that yet, but you could parameterize the model using a Gaussian process um, and then sort of solve it as an optimization problem. Essentially, um, this is one potential way of making it transdimensional, where um, basically you have a link between a sort of a lower rank representation of the subsurface using, for example, a Gaussian process, and then the forward solver, which probably needs a finite element expression for the subsurface um, electroresistivity, and you would sort of just do a transformation back and forth, and then you might do um, your sampling over the low rank space, but then verify against the data using the higher rank space, something along those lines. That's actually what the the, the TDGP uh, random off metropolis sampler was doing. Um, it's just hopelessly slow because it's serial. Oh, oh sorry. No, go ahead, Will. Go ahead. I, I um, just, just, just another thing. So, you know, your, your method was called the randomized, then optimized. And it kind of reminds me of uh, these other methods called discretized, then optimized. And then it's competing uh, model optimized, then discretized. So, do you think? Optimized and randomized could be another method. <laughs> Possibly, I haven't even considered that. Okay. Uh, right. I have a question about the first part of your talk. I'm forgetting all my metamorphic petrology. So when I hear, you know, the difference between melt and then water, I'm trying to picture what that looks like in the mineral structure. So you have peridotite, which is 40% olivine, and then the water. Is that in some kind of amphibole in the mineral structure? I think it's actually, um, I think it's the pyroxenes actually that absorb most of the water. If I, unless I'm mistaken, I think it's the pyroxenes that have the highest um, sort of water absorption ability. If there's no melt, as soon as you get a little bit of melt, the water flees the mineral structure and goes into the melt phase almost um, completely, not totally, but overwhelmingly. Okay. And then this idea of the plume being a source of, of melt or, or water or both. Yeah, um, the, the, the plume would provide the temperature and, the, and the, the volatiles to generate the melt. And then the water would all partition into the melt producing this sort of like water saturated partial melt. That's the idea. Okay, yeah, I've not heard that before. That's an interesting idea. So it means there's a deep source of water is what you're thinking. Yeah, so we know from, from uh, geochemical samples that plumes are generally water rich, that they sort of punch through the transition zone and keep their water with them on the way up, whereas sort of standard mantle convection loses its water at the transition zone. Basically, the, the, the phase transitions that occur at the transition zone sort of squeeze all the water out and it stays below the transition zone, whereas plumes sort of punch through that layer and, and bring their water with them. Are there observations of a lack of this high conductivity zone in areas that are unaffected by plumes? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, there, there's there's plenty of MT surveys that have shown absolutely no strong conductivity contrast at the base of the lithosphere, like we've seen. There are plenty of places in the world without a thin conductive channel, without a doubt. Yeah, this isn't sort of a global explanation of the LAB. It's more this might be happening in the vicinity of plumes. Okay, very good. Well, Daniel, thanks very much. Thank you. I appreciate it.